asking me to do this. Uh, I was actually here last night, and it was a fantastic performance. Let me check sound. Is it okay for everybody? Yeah. Um, and uh, that uh, was a real treat. The audience was laugh filled. Uh, and you sort of wonder how can a play that begins with the seven deadly sins and then the black death of the 14th century uh, cause us to think deeply and yet laugh in the efforts? But this play succeeds that in part because of the artistry, the playwright, the performers, and the production staff. And I say kudos to them all. So, why am I here? And with a talk titled The History of AIDS in Madison. Uh, it's important to realize that this play was written pre-COVID. So the only prior experience the pandemic uh, that is recent for most of us, that's in Russia, Europe, in 1918 from the Spanish flu. And I said, muscle talk, I go around, we're under three. Uh, then the AIDS pandemic is the closest experience uh, to a pandemic of play, which has a focus on the Black Death pandemic, which was sweeping here. So, AIDS today is in the background of the play, uh, and I lived in the 1980s through that period. Additionally, uh, I was on the board and I was a support member for a number of years. And in the second volume, the two volumes of uh, Wisconsin Day History, titled Coming Out, Moving Forward, Wisconsin's recent gay history. I have a chapter on the Wisconsin AIDS response. So I've done both some research as well as have personal experience uh, in dealing with the pandemic um, in my life. I think we may not remember today that AIDS took 700,000 Americans and 32 million people worldwide. So it was a real pandemic. Uh, the numbers for the Spanish flu they're suffering by any means, was 675,000 Americans and 50 million worldwide. Uh, and COVID, we know, is already over 700,000, 800,000 Americans. So uh, pandemics are something that affect many of us in so many different ways. And I wrote in May of 2020, at the beginning of COVID, we can draw a life affirmation and hope from the history of confronting AIDS as we confront COVID. But I must remember, encourage you to remember, that it was a struggle. President Reagan refused to mention the word AIDS until 1985, after it had spread all across the country. The first Wisconsin case was reported in the press early in 1983, though actually Research showed that the disease was already here in 1980. Unlike COVID, with billions dedicated to the fight against it, we had to hold bake sales on this week's Sunday to raise money to support AIDS organizations. It was a tough time in the struggle against that pandemic. So I bring a gray lens to the idea of the epidemic, but I want to go back with that gay lens uh, to the 1950s, in the beginning of the home file movement. Uh, and founded in 1915, uh, that was known by 1951 as the Madison Society, was the first real gay rights organization in the country. They had discarded the names Society of Androgynous Minority. They also discarded Bachelors of Monogamous and discarded Society of Fools. The name that they adopted, the Madison, were medieval French secret societies of masked men. So like our play tonight, there's a medieval connection between this name and the first gay rights organization in the Middle Ages. Now, these Madachines in their day, through their anonymity of the masks, were empowered to criticize the ruling monarch with impunity. They could ask questions about traditional roles and beliefs that many people in their day are not. And that's an important thing as you see the play tonight. Now the founder of the Madison Society was Harry Hay, and he 
he, in 1948, had formed Bachelors for Wallace. Uh, Wallace was the presidential candidate on the Progressive Party ticket in 1948, uh, which Harry Truman won. But Hay had been a communist for 15 years, and so he knew something about secret societies and cells. Uh, and uh, the Communist Party had backed Wallace in 1948, amongst many other progressives as well, but they were not the only ones. And Hay lived in Los Angeles, which was a port city. And many gay men after World War II, he mobilized from the Pacific on West Coast cities, and they stayed there. Alan Burbay, a gay historian, has noted that many of the gays simply stayed in those cities rather than went back to their home towns. He would later say he felt that in the 1950s, gays were a masked people, thus the managing name. In more modern times, the idea of masking and unmasking could be expressed in coming out of the closet, dropping the mask, revealing oneself. Masks are used in the play, as you'll see tonight. So this particular link back to the early managing society, I think, is significant. Now, in the early 1980s, in Wisconsin and nationally, there had been a decade of gay organizing following the Stonewall riots in 1969. Yet activists were still few and far between, and those who had dropped their masks to seek agency over their own lives as out persons were particularly rare. They felt a need to change the narrative about homosexuals as criminals and as sick psychiatrists had defined them. And so they needed to come out to tell their own stories. In the early 1980s, the gay press began to have stories about a new and mysterious disease called GRID. GRID, G R I D, stood for Gay Related Immune Deficiency as they started to report diseases getting members of the gay community, particularly on the east and west coast. By the time in May of 83, when the first Wisconsin case appeared, GRID had been renamed to AIDS. And so they had tried to disassociate it directly from sexual orientation. In February of 84, already, Governor Tony Earl issued her AIDS, an AIDS awareness proclamation that I particularly Drafted. Again, President Reagan had not done anything on AIDS that he had mentioned. And in fact, the Reagan Justice Department had okay that it was fine to fire persons with AIDS. Wisconsin's Division of Equal Rights took a different track and said that AIDS was a protective disability. So there was a difference in how Wisconsin responded than the national response. Governor Earl being the first really pro LBGT governor in the state, and created a council on lesbian and gay issues, which I ended up co chairing. And in our first meeting, we adopted a resolution seeking more national resources for AIDS, both uh, for medical research and for prevention activities. At our second meeting in uh, 83, we had uh, King Morrison, who was head of the Division of Health in Wisconsin, come uh, and speak to the council. She then opened the door for the Wisconsin Medical Society, which adopted an early statement published in their journal in 83 about the non judgmental stance that physicians should take. They also, in uh, their magazine, in addition to printing that stance, listed lesbian and gay organizations as resources to be called upon around the state in those communities where they existed. So but there was a reluctance to overcome the ignorance about medical treatment for homosexuals. Dr. Greminger, who was with the Brady Street East Clinic in Milwaukee, had an article in the Medical Society of the Bulletin about how to take a sexual history since many dogs did not know they had been patients, required lowering masks, coming out of hiding individually as we began to deal with the epidemic. There's also a term that arose during the AIDS crisis called a phrase. This was uh, people who were concerned about knowing that AIDS spread by sexual activity, and they were afraid to have sexual activity because of it. 
And this whole episode of whether you continue the sexual revolution, which has been a key part of gay liberation, whether you had to give that up in the fight against AIDS. And that was a real struggle, both socially within the community and intellectually. Early here in Madison, the Blue Bus Clinic provided uh, treatment, and uh, AIDS Support Network picked that up as well. And safer sex information became key to getting information out, as well as providing condoms. Jim Tellison, who was the director of the Blue Bus Clinic, created a wonderful document, an artifact called Condom Machine. He took a PVC pipe and branched it into like a tree. And he put a different kind of condom at the end of each PVC pipe, and then he could inflate it. And so he could talk about the need for using the condoms for safer sex. Uh, in the book, I detail another unfortunate episode where the Racine School Board wanted to test both students and employees for HIV and to fire positive teachers from their school district. Uh, the whole question of how to deal with these issues is very sticky. Minnesota AIDS activist was encouraging people in that state to take the HIV test in Wisconsin. The reason he urged that was because Wisconsin in the early 80s had passed AIDS confidentiality information uh, and signed the governor, as well as the fact that in 1982 we had a non discrimination law based on sexual orientation. So if they were using HIV status to discover homosexuals in systems, they could not fire them under Wisconsin law. So how to teach safer sex became an issue. And many places simply ignored that and didn't teach it. Another part of the story in Wisconsin is ACT UP. And because of the great efforts in the early administration uh, to do a careful, thoughtful response, there was less state government protest in Wisconsin by ACT UP than there was in some other places. But basically, ACT UP was urging people to drop the mask, for society to drop the mask. Uh, it was initially a seizing of agency of trying to do something about AIDS. Uh, ACT UP Wisconsin, particularly in Milwaukee, would go out and drop information on safer sex literature and condoms in high schools. Uh, they did it at both public high schools and they did it at the Marquette uh, High School associated with the university. Uh, there, the police were called on them. Uh, condoms were particularly appreciated at that Catholic institution. Uh, the activists noted, though, that when they were done with their uh, activity at a high school, there would be some literature that was being spread on the ground and people didn't retain. But all the condoms were taken and not dropped on the ground. So, there was some sense that the word was getting across. But in thinking about it, these AIDS activists had to become noble amateurs in medicine. They followed the clinical trials and urged speedier drug availability. They had to become noble amateurs in public health. Uh, and they had to invent messaging that could reach the community. Then the riots when she got complaints from legislators about explicit AIDS prevention messaging wrote back to Senator Ellis that we're not trying to reach people like you who are safe, we're trying to reach people who need more explicit information. So part of the ACT UP effort was creating a narrative to counter the feeling of hopelessness and powerlessness. And in some ways, they succeeded. In February of 1988, I attended the war conference in Virginia, right outside of D.C., was a follow-up to the 1987 march on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. And part of the statement from the conference was, our community is facing unprecedented threats. Not only do we gaily face the homophobia that's caused lesbians and gay men, their sex sense of dignity and self-worth, and all too often their lives, we now see and be decimated by the scourge of AIDS. There was a call at the conference for collective community action to fight back. One of the things that came out of the war conference was National Coming Out Day, which still is observed on October 11th, which was the anniversary of the 1987 March. The 
you may or may not recall if you're old enough, the big triangles that appeared on Baskin Hill as part of coming out day. There was also the galvanized march of the Capitol where over 5,000 people showed up uh, to protest the need for better treatment for gays and lesbians in 1989. One of the people with me at that board conference was gay historian John Emilio. And he had noted that so many creative ways to express our grief, like the quilt, uh, had come into existence. And indeed, the quilt came to Madison that same weekend as the galvanizing Uh But he posed a question Do we want to develop a political strategy for liberation that is based on grief? Uh, basically, his answer was no. He noted, terror entered my life the moment I became aware that I was scary. Where would I be if I let gay terror serve as my guide for action? Terror is an individual response, and I needed a collective action as an alternative. So it's not just individuals have to drop their masks, but the community as a whole had to join in action. One of the people who was involved in uh, Madison and up was David Savage, who might know later as the advice columnist of Savage Love. He was then a student at UW, and he ended up protesting, among other things, the treatment of persons with AIDS in Wisconsin prisons, where the security folks decided that they would not let persons with AIDS in the general population come to the meal rooms, but they simply provide them with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in their cells. So the protest held, 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 held excuse me, uh, Governor Tommy Thompson's office with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in one of their protests. So, when we're confronted with a crisis like an epidemic, what is the artistic influence? That's one of the key things in this play. In the 14th century play, God appears on high trying to order things. But actors begin to wonder if the promise not to destroy the world again flood is real, and whether the symbol of that promise in the rainbow should be questioned. So, during the AIDS crisis, Bill Jones and I, Bill Jones was a dancer and choreographer of very famous in New York, he lost his partner in AIDS. He and I were on a panel at the Union Theater. I, as a board member of the Madison AIDS Network, and a former chair of the Wisconsin Arts Board. And one of the questions that day was, do you believe in miracles? Show your hands. Both Jones and I raised our hands on that occasion. This was not a sort of support for, oh, I'm going to drop the crutches, but a, a belief that something larger than our fear was possible. This was the same influence of that God, that some agency was required rather than simply accepting as they were. One of the items that appeared during the epidemic in Wisconsin was Wisconsin Poets for AIDS in an anthology in 1987. Richard Sims, in writing, sort of about masking, I cover my heart with bones and flesh and believe what others say, but I am not who I know I am. Norman Richards, in another Tonight I'm wishing for a miracle to erase that four-letter word from everyone's mind, from everyone's life. That was one artistic impulse response to an epidemic. Very Wisconsinites, various Wisconsinites were interviewed and talked about their stories. Mark and his partner Jason had returned to Madison uh, with the epidemic. And he wrote, I'm not afraid of dying, I'm afraid of not living. So this was the challenge of the period. How do you figure out to continue your life and the community's life in the face of an epidemic? Amateurs is an epidemic play, not unlike some of the first generation of AIDS plays, like Angels in America, which is more of stark truths and many moments of crying. That won't be your experience tonight. My take is the author of Amateurs uses actors dropping their masked roles or assigned lines as a means to call for human agency 
in the face of epidemics. If men and women are in God's image, do they have a role in creation rather than just growing passive players? My own experience in the AIDS crisis leads to an affirmation, and that is a message of hope and carrying on. Kushner's great Angels of America play, the second part of Perestroika, ended with a soliloquy by its chief character, Prior Walter, noting, we won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. The play closes with, I now, you are fabulous creatures, each and every one, and I bless you, more life. The great work begins. You'll try and have this framework as you see the play, and I hope it helps you understand some of the things the author is doing. We have a little time for questions. Let me know. Is he a good cup? No, I have time for one more. Certainly, you can find 
I'll be a pregnant still. Okay, good. Questions, anyone? Sure. I love this analogy about the art community to the masks and right? I wonder, in your decades of leadership in this community, where you are now, has Madison as a community, what are your masks Oh, Madison still has a lot of masks, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> Oh, but LBGT rights here in town are uh, well advanced. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement in so many ways. Um, and uh, in some ways, and this is, you know, I'm an old curmudgeon, I guess, is that uh, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, we built institutions that would support our community because we had to do it ourselves in many ways. Um, and now uh, the young people who are growing up don't have any sense of that struggle for the most part. Um, that's not true for trans people, certainly, but it is true for a lot of younger gays and lesbians that their acceptance in society is openness to them. Uh, and that means you can no longer support institutions like gay bars because they can go to any bar. They don't have to go to a gay bar and find uh, a place to have drinks and find other people. Uh, you also have technology replacing some of that. So the nature of community changes, but I hope it doesn't disappear. Yes. What's the status of the AIDS epidemic today? Uh, there's very good treatments, though, when uh, President Trump said that there was vaccine for AIDS. He was wrong. There is, there was not a vaccine for AIDS. There is eventually one, I think, that may be coming, but so, but it's treatable, and if you take uh, PrEP, it can be preventable for transmission as well. Uh, so, a lot of progress, but that's after decades of work. And when you think of COVID in response, we're talking years, it's still like AIDS was the first stepchild of epidemics uh, that we were around. So, it's much, 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 much better. Still tragic too. Anything else? If not, we'll just say thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, this yes, please. I'm Sam Ryan the Shield House in nineteen ninety five and wrote and I worked there for over ten years. Great. And it started with a place that people would go to die. And it ended with a place that people could live on. And I can thank you for your help. And I'm reminded of a, a time in 457 where I was Christopher Christopher Hawkins uh, yes. in Milwaukee. And it's through a demonstration in high school where he ended up comics. Mm -hmm. And he's the story of the boy, he wanted to try and press in the same comics. It's yes. been a long journey. It has been a long journey. And uh, that effort to try and save lesbian and gay kids from the ignorance and the prohibition of knowledge was an important effort by ACT UP and Christopher Collins and others uh, like him. So um, it's important to remember those folks and to draw on their courage as we continue to try and sort out our lives and how we deal with epidemics. So I still think there are lessons to learn from studying what has happened with AIDS and that uh, you can use that as part of the background of watching the play. So, that I will say thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.